Hello, everyone. I am Michael Lardner uh, from the Marxist Education Project, one of the two groups that got together to host this fantastic event uh, based on an essential read uh, at, at multiple levels, but the Marx revival with new concepts and new interpretations is a, a work that I know Marcello has close to his heart based on the, the amount of time we went up about getting this organized with Shelter and Solidarity. It's such an important day. There are other events that the Marxist Education Project is doing. Uh, very quickly, we have a two-part presentation that is four o'clock today and tomorrow with the Yale Working Group on Globalization uh, uh, and Culture, which is uh, has as a theme this year, state formations and forming states. And uh, for those of you who have been to our prior presentations with the working group, the, there will be uh, uh, nine people making incredibly uh, uh, cogent uh, and original presentations. If you're looking for up and coming people in various areas, it's a good uh, event to come to. And then Tuesday night in the Marx, Engels Marxism series that Marcello edits with Paul Grave, we have Steve Marr visiting, who is talking about corporate capital in the US and the integral state with a focus on the integration of General Electric with the, the American state. That's enough from me. This I'm taking too many minutes away from the discussion and, and writings in this valuable book. Uh, Marcello, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. Good afternoon, good morning, everybody, depending on where you are. <clears throat> and uh, it is becoming um, um, a meeting that we are having very often every, every week and more or less. I feel a little bit sad when I'm not with you. Um, so this is the second part. Two weeks ago, we had a discussion with um, between John Bellamy Foster and I, and this is the second part of the of this, um, let's say, delayed book launch of the Marx revival because the book just came out in the middle of COVID. Despite this, this volume has been very successful, um, big success, translated in many countries. Actually, this week we are publishing the Korean translation by Hanul Publishing House, which is um, the biggest company in uh, in South Korea and Seoul. So it's um, very good news. Today we have um, five leading scholars and uh, um, contributors to this collection. Bob Jessop will talk about state, Michael Kretke about capitalism, the first in Lancaster, the second in Amsterdam, and then Heather Brown in the United States, um, Michael Lowy in Paris, and Peter Rudis in the spring of Chicago, right? As he told us at the beginning of this. Each of them will have 15 minutes for a total of 15 minutes, 75 in total, if they will all be um, nice and um, polite. And then after this, um, with the help of um, Michael and Kira, um, that I uh, thank very much for the organization and for all the work that they do, to put these events together. We will have Q&A and each speaker will have five minutes to reply to the questions that we will have. If we can, we will try to do a couple of rounds with three, four questions per round. So the first speaker is Bob Jessop. At the time when the book was published, he was distinguished professor of sociology at Lancaster. He retired a few months ago. He has done, he has written, he has been too much prolific to um, be presented in a few words, but among this book, there are The Capitalist State, Marxist Theory and Methods, 1982, a book on Polanzas, Marxist Theory and Political Strategy, 85, State Theory, Putting the Capitalist State in its Place, Polity, 1990, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until one of his last works, that is The State, Past, Present, Future, Polity, 2016. Just to say, as many people will know, that the state has been one of its uh, most relevant topic of research. So, Bob, are you there? 15 minutes for you. Talking on Marx on the state, and my starting point will be the so-called missing theory of the state. When people are talking about Marx on the state, 
they were referring to the fact he didn't write the promised book on the state, which was part of the six book plan for capital. And I'll be introducing three approaches that developed, Marx developed to the state and state power, focusing on his form analysis, then looking at some case studies, referring to his discussion of the dictatorship of the proletariat, and then reaching some conclusions. So we can begin with um, a statement that what has come down to us is the Marxist theory of the state as a simplification and even a distortion of the writings of Marx and Engels on that subject. And I can refer here to a letter of Friedrich Engels to Franz Mehring in 1893, where Engels says, we neglected the formal side of political, juridical and other ideological notions, the way which these notions come about for the sake of their inner content. And I'll be arguing that Marx analyzed not only the content of state power, but also emphasized the analysis of the formal aspects of the state. In terms of Marx's three approaches to the state, it's often pointed out that there are two approaches that Marx developed, an instrumentalist approach and an autonomous approach. So the first approach is the idea that the state is an instrument of class rule, which was initiated in Marx's contributions to the Rheinische Zeitung in 1843 and continued thereafter, including in the Manifesto of the Communist Party, uh, which is one of the most famous quotations from Marx on the state. Alternatively, there is an idea that Marx developed the idea of the state as an autonomous authority that can win significant freedom for maneuver when an unstable balance of class forces threatens disorder. And this is best illustrated by the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. But I want to emphasize there is a third Marxist approach, which actually is the most important and stable element in his theory of state and state power which is the state is an alienated form of political organization that based on the separation of rulers and ruled, which has different forms in different class-based modes of production. And he's developed this idea, first of all, in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of law in the introduction to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. And I'm arguing that this alienated form of political organization is the most important basis for Marx's analysis of the state. And as I said, this originated in his critique of Hegel, but when he left the Rheinische Zeitung, he began to study on the state and he studied the history of states their relation to society and development in France, which was a major interest of his for a long time in Italy, in Poland, in England, in Germany, Sweden, and the United States. He was particularly interested in the English and French revolutions, and he looked at related texts on political and constitutional theory. And he argued that the emerging bourgeois social formation was marked by the institutional separation of the public sphere with the state at its center in which politics is oriented to the collective interest and civil society in which private property and individual self-interest are dominant. This is also an idea developed, of course, by Hegel. But in contrast to Hegel's view of the state, which claims that the modern state could and would represent the common organic interests of all members of society, Marx was the view that it could only represent an illusory community of interest beneath which would lie the continuing antagonisms, crass materialism, and egoistic conflicts of a society based on private property and wage labor. And Marx's argument that the modern state would only disappear when the society based on private property and wage labor also disappeared. After he left the 
Rheinische Zeitung, he drew a draft plan for a work on the modern state in November 1844. And this was a comprehensive analysis, which had 11 themes that were emphasized. He would explore the history of the origin of the modern state or the French Revolution, the proclamation of the rights of man, the constitution of the state, the relationship between state and civil society. He would explore the constitutional representative state and the democratic representative state. He would explore the division between the legislative and executive powers, the legislative power, legislative bodies and political clubs, the centralization and hierarchy of the executive power, juridical power and the law, the relationship between nationality and the people, political parties, and the fight to abolish the state and bourgeois society. As I said, this was a draft plan for work on the modern state, and it was a set of themes that Marx continued to study until his death. In terms of form analysis, Marx argued in Das Kapital, Volume 3, that the specific economic form in which unpaid surplus labor is pumped out of direct producers determines the relationship of rulers and ruled as it grows directly out of production itself and in turn reacts upon it as a determining element. Upon this, however, is founded the entire formation of the economic community, which grows up out of the production relations themselves thereby simultaneously its specific political form. It is always the direct relationship of the owners of the conditions of production to direct producers, which reveals the innermost secret, the hidden basis of the entire social structure, and with it, the political form of the relation of sovereignty and dependence. In short, the corresponding specific form of the state. Now, this quotation is often given and it's often read in a deterministic way that the economic form determines the form of the state and also its content. But Marx is not arguing that the form of the state also determines the content of the state. And one of the important challenges in Marx's theory of the state is to relate the form of the state to the changing balance of forces and see how the changing balance of forces alters the contents of political policy. And in this regard, we can refer to Marx's class struggles in France, where he rely, relates to the uh, attempt to establish a bourgeois democratic constitution. And he says, it puts the classes whose social slavery is democratic constitution is to perpetuate the proletariat, peasantry, petty bourgeoisie in possession of political power by a universal suffrage. And from the bourgeois class whose old social power it sanctions or supports, it withdraws the political guarantees of this power. It forces the political rule of the bourgeoisie into democratic conditions which at every moment helped the hostile classes to victory and jeopardize the very foundations of bourgeois society. From the first group, that is to say, from the subaltern classes, he demands they should not advance from political to social emancipation. And from the second class, the dominant class, that they should not seek a political restoration by abolishing democracy. And I think this is an important quotation for showing how Marx analyzes the forms as well as the changing balance of forces. Moving on, we can look at how he explores this in his analysis of the changes in factory legislation in Das Kapital, where he explores the changes in factory legislation, which reflect the competition between different capitals. So when competition is absolute, based on extending the working day and increasing the intensity of labor, a competition stops any individual capitalist from being the first to cut hours 
reduce female and child labor and improve working conditions. And it's required therefore that the state intervenes to overcome cutthroat competition that's caused growing infant and adult mortality, demographic decline and declining productivity. And it was promoted in part by the more advanced capitals that were relying on relative surplus value, but as well as factory inspectors and other officials. And many social forces combined to press the state to pass the legislation against the will of many individual capitalists. And this is only possible because of the formal separation of economic and political power. And, uh, and uh, another case study that we could look at is the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, which was part of Marx's long interest in the French Revolution and changes in the French state and its political regimes. Indeed, Marx studied the French state more than he did the English state. He understood England was ahead economically, but lagged politically, and he drew more of his ideas about the development of the modern state by studying the French state. And his interest in studying the 18th Brumaire was to study the specificity of political struggles in a modern state. He argues that no class is directly and unambiguously represented as such on the political scene. And so his concern in the 18th Brumaire is to decipher the class bases and or class relevance of diverse political forces, of political factions, parties, the army, paramilitary forces, mobs, intellectuals, journalists, and so forth. And he notes that men make their own history, but not in circumstances of their own choosing. And he adds that these are um, influenced in part by inherited political vocabularies in discourses. And he argues that a revolutionary movement must develop a poetry of the future rather than express its demands in the language of the past. And he argues that uh, Louis Bonaparte, the nephew of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, came to power through an opportunist, uh, opportunistic effort to seize power that was accepted because of the growing political crisis which was only loosely rooted in economic crisis and big fears about the collapse of social order when the dominated classes were politically paralyzed and all wanted a strong leader. And this emphasizes once again, the importance of analyzing not only the form of the state, but also its class bases and the changing balance of political forces. He was puzzled by the development of Bonapartism because he didn't understand or couldn't understand initially whether it was a personal dictatorship, a bureaucratic or military dictatorship, or a class dictatorship. And he answered in the end that Louis Bonaparte represented rhetorically, if not materially, the largest social class in France at the time, the small holding conservative peasantry. And he represented them in terms of a demagogic poetry of the past, the old Napoleon ideas, the re revival of Napoleon's glories, and cheap material concessions, such as providing jobs for their children in the state apparatus. And he didn't defend them, however, against the further parcelization of their land holdings mortgage debt, tax burdens, or the speculative depredations of the modern financial aristocracy. He was interested also in the abolition of the state. And he argued in commenting on the civil war in France in 1871, that it wasn't clear until the Paris Commune was formed how the state would be abolished. And he argued that the state would be abolished when the work, um, sorry, the, the, he, he argued that the state would not be abolished until the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for its own purposes. 
the political instrument of their enslavement cannot serve as the political instrument of their emancipation. And he argued that the Paris Commune prefigured what a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie would be like. And I'm reaching now my conclusions. Marx didn't complete the missing book promised in the six book plan of capital. He did produce a consistent form analysis, the modern bourgeois state and developed it in his conjunctural studies. He concluded the modern bourgeois state could not be the state form that enabled workers to move from political power to social emancipation. And this required the abolition of the formal separation of economic and political power typical of bourgeois societies. In short, form analysis was the essential stable element in Marx's analyses of the state and state power, but always combined with an analysis of the changing conjunctures and changing forms of balance of political power, which shaped the ways in which the content of the state of its policies and so forth was worked. And that brings me to my 15 minutes. So Marcello, over to you. Thank you very much, Bob. It was a perfect synthesis of your chapter and of course of uh, also Marx's views on the state. Um, we have many speakers today and I can also welcome my friend, Michael Lowy who join us. And I'm not making any comments on your presentation, otherwise this will take too much time, but this was excellent. And I will now go to the second speaker. Uh, Bob, there will be more question and discussion for you, of course, later during the Q&A. The second speaker from Lancaster to Amsterdam, even though Michael Kretke was also professor of sociology at Lancaster University and before he was at uh, Amsterdam. And um, Michael has written the opening chapter of the book, Capitalism, and he will talk about capitalism today. Uh, he is also uh, one of the most um, known specialists of Marx, author of many books, recently uh, Kritik der politische Ökonomie heute, Zeitgenosse Marx, Faue Safer Lag 2017, more forthcoming soon. I'm just mentioning this one, Michael. And um, Michael Kretke is also one of the co-author of another uh, edited collection that I'm editing and that is going to be published this year with Routledge. The title of this book is Marx and Le Capital, History, Evaluation, Reception. And uh, this is important because it is um, related to the 150th anniversary of the French um, translation of Capital, which was also made by Marx. But we'll talk about this during the fall with another presentation. For now, let's stay with the Marx survival. Michael, welcome and 15 minutes for you as well. Okay, thank you very much. I will do it without PowerPoint because I only have 15 minutes and I will make some remarks about the theory of capitalism in Marx, about his general attitude towards uh, modern capitalism, about his critique of capitalism, about the salient features of this theory, which is quite complicated, and uh, about the tendencies that uh, Marx analyzed, described um, in many ways, the tendencies of development the modern, uh, of, of modern capitalism. And in the end, I will make a few remarks about what revival means with respect to this part of Marx's heritage, of Marx's uh, legacy, the theory of capitalism. Well, let me first and foremost state, uh, Marx is, although he is normally uh, uh, regarded otherwise, he is not in the first place a theorist of communism or socialism. You will find a lot of remarks and hints and observations and ideas about communism and socialism in his many writings, but he is a theorist of modern capitalism. And that is the core of his work, the most important part of his legacy. And this legacy is both a theory and a critique or criticism of modern capitalism. It is indispensable until this very day 
because at least for people who know the state of the art in modern economics and in the economics of his time, uh, it is by far the best, if there are any others comparable to his, and there are very few. So the few that do exist are all strongly influenced by Marx, like uh, most of the classical, the founding fathers of sociology, most of them Germans, are str very strongly influenced by Marx's work. So in my view, I, I state this very bluntly, uh, Marx's theory of capitalism is still the best. And for the largest part of contemporary economics and contemporary political economy, there is no clear concept of capitalism at all. Although Marx theory has been argued about and has been debated and disputed for now more than 150 years, the basic insights are still unsurpassed and its complexity is unrivaled. Um, second, it might be puzzling for many, it still is when you first encounter uh, Marx, but he is not condemning capitalism as the evil source of all the evils of the world. On the contrary, Marx is praising capitalism. Uh, you will find a lot of uh, eulogies, you might call them, on capitalism in his writings, uh, on the civiliz civilizing effects, the civilizing tendencies, the modernizing tendencies, although he didn't use the term modernizing, uh, the epoch of capitalism, in Marx's view, belongs to the few progressive epochs in the history of mankind. Capitalism is, by comparison, by historical comparison, uh, the most dynamic, the most innovative, the most productive, the most versatile form of an economy and society that ever existed. So Marx is full of praise for capitalism and not the smallest of the merits of this historical system of production and exchange in Marx's view is the following capitalism and capitalism only. That is Marx's view until his very last day is generating all the necess necessary material, technological, mental, intellectual, prerequisites for a higher form of, so, of uh, society. So wh whatever you call it, socialism, uh, communism, uh, all this is only imaginable in Marx's view because of the achievements that are uh, that a whole long epoch of capitalist development have brought us. So Marx was never shy to praise the civilizing tendencies of a capitalist economy and society in the heartlands and beyond. However, Marx's theory of capitalism is by the same token, a theory uh, of capitalism and a thorough and radical critique of capitalism. So how does Marx criticize capitalism that he's praising uh, at the same time, more or less? not on moral grounds, although you might find, you can find some moral or ethical arguments also in the writings of Marx. He's not an amoral person, but he was strictly opposed throughout his life to a moralizing critique. The main thrust of uh, his critique of capitalism is twofold. Uh, apart from his critique, of course, that you all find of main tenets of classical political economy. So the economists have got it all wrong about capitalism and the practicing capitalists are mostly confused. They also do not understand what their own economic system is all about. But Marx's uh, critique of capitalism is going in two directions. First, regarding the inherent inconsistencies and instabilities of uh, capitalist forms, capitalist institutions, uh, because of what he calls, and many people immediately recognize as the famous inner contradictions of modern capitalism. There are many, so I do not go into any detail here. 
And the second thrust of his uh, critique is uh, regarding the tendencies that are unleashed by modern capitalism and unfolding within the framework of modern capitalism, which are, in his view, inevitably undermining uh, the whole structure of modern capitalism, undermining its natural basis, undermining its social basis, also undermining its moral basis, and so on. So the basic idea there is capitalism is a self-destructive system, and everybody participating in it is caught in this logic of self-destruction. So in short, in Marx's view, capitalism is fragile, is vulnerable, permanently prone to crisis, to all kinds of catastrophes of its own making, as well as self-destructive in the long run. Well, um, Marx's theory, as I've said before, stands out due to some very strong and very particular features. Marx's theory is a theory of social relations. So capital, for instance, and his concept of capital is still the best we have, is not a thing, but a specific relationship or a bundle of relationships between people, although in the guise of an impersonal relation between things or aggregates of things. It is also a process in time and space. So Marx's concept of capital is by far the best and the most sophisticated from the point of view of the social sciences. It's not a philosophical concept. It's not a purely technical concept, but uh, from the point of view of so the social sciences, it grasps all the essential uh, elements that are uh, to be grasped there. Marx's theory does not only deal with the relations between people, but also with their behavior, with their mindset, with their way of thinking about their social relationships, the way in which they reflect about and imagine what they are doing in everyday economic interactions. These ways of thinking is what he calls and what he finds uh, in the writings, uh, not only of theoretical economists, but also of the uh, journalists of his time, the economic categories. And these economic categories are all mystified. According to Marx, the world of capitalism is a world of mystifications. He even goes as far as to say these are insane forms. Uh, these mystifications can be deciphered and they can be analyzed, and hence there is a further thrust of his critique of capitalism, that is demystification of the main components of what in the end, if you do not just stick to the very first uh, steps in Marx's analysis, the famous forms of form of value, but follow him throughout his work, throughout his analysis, what in the end boils down to a full scale uh, uh, everyday uh, uh, or religion of everyday life, which informs and supports all the agents in the capitalist economy. That is what you find, not at the beginning, but at the end. And it's quite much more complicated uh, than uh, what he states in the beginning of his analysis on the forms of value. Well, Marx's theory is an F of capitalism is an effort to analyze and understand not the economy in general, but a very specific historical form of it. Capitalism is a historical economic system. Marx thinks it starts uh, in the 15th century. One can debate that. Uh, uh, capitalism is a historical economic system with a beginning, with an end, although we do not know exactly, and it don't, doesn't tell us uh, when the end will come and how capitalism might end. Uh, but it has very specific features. Many of the institutions that are crucial for capitalism uh, or its category, the categories in which we understand it already exist for a very long time. 
uh, there have been markets for thousands of years. There have been, there has been money, there have been credits, there have even been wage labor, there have been even forms of capital that are much, much older than modern capitalism. So the salient point is to grasp in which respect, in which ways these forms in within the framework of modern capitalism are different. And capital in capitalism is different from capital in antiquity. And so is money, and so is the commodity, and so are the markets, and so is wage labor, and so on. Well, uh, Marx is dealing with capitalism, although he had studied also pre-capitalist forms, but he doesn't say very much about it. It's more to sharpen his idea of what is really specific uh, about these forms within modern capitalism as compared to other economic systems in history. For example, capital, capitalism cannot be identified as the majority of contemporary economists still do as just a market or the market economy. It's a very specific kind of market economy. It's comprising a set of very peculiar kinds of markets like labor markets, uh, <clears throat> money markets, capital markets, or let us say financial markets, markets for natural re uh, resources, real estate markets, and so on, all of them coming with very peculiar features, all of them very different from each other. Uh, so the standard uh, economist view, a market is a market. So the labor market is in principle, the same as the market for lemons is in the eyes of Marx, completely nonsense, complete nonsense. Uh, Marx regarded capitalism as a system of economic exploitation. That is what most people immediately will recall. Exploitation of human labor, but also exploitation of natural resources. Um, it is, the mo in Marx's view, again, the most advanced, the most sophisticated, and the most fanatic, but also the most rational system ever that uh, ever existed in human history of exploitation and the private appropriation uh, of the spoils of exploitation is one of the core driving forces no ma of, of capitalism, no matter how these spoils are measured. They could be measure, measured as profits, as interest, as rents, and there are a lot of uh, more complicated forms to measure them. Exploitation in capitalism comes in various forms and it has a development. Uh, the production appropriation of surplus value due to the exploitation of uh, human labor power or, and the labor power of free laborers is the most important according to Marx, but there are many other forms beside uh, this uh, direct uh, exploitation within the production process. And many, there are many other agents and beneficiaries of exploitation as well. Uh, a thought, a basic idea which is present in Marx, although never really elaborated. Last but not least about these features for Marx, capitalism, is the most dynamic economic system so far uh, with an inherent and unrelenting drive towards growth, uh, accelerated growth, uh, expansion and change. Change, technological change, organizational change in various production processes is driven by the urge to enhance uh, the production and appropriation of surplus labor. So the structural changes in one plant or one enterprise lead to similar changes in many plants and enterprises, hence to overall uh, uh, changes in the whole fabric of uh, the capitalist economy in the longer run. Because of its inherent drive towards innovations and changes, Capitalist economies are undergoing smaller and larger transformations all the time. Capitalism as Marx sees it, and I nearly quote now, is not a solid crystal, but an ever-changing, adaptable, ver highly versatile organism, a learning system, you might even say. Capitalists are not stupid. 
entrepreneurs, managers are not stupid. They are learning all the time. They're improving all the time. And that is a way in which capitalism uh, as a system deals with its many inner contradictions by transforming itself again and again. This is also one of the original thoughts of Marx. You deal with contradictions by developing new forms in which these contradictions or these contradictory forces can interact. Fifth, capitalism in Marx's view is a historical economic system of innovation, of change, but also of individual freedom, including the uh, modern uh, workers, uh, the wage laborers, and even equality, equality in market relations, and a lot of inequality, of course, uh, in the historical form of free competition. This is a buzzword of political economy, and this is still uh, the basic credo of all the economists today, and Marx set himself the task to develop systematically a concept of competition in, instead of just using it as a buzzword everywhere. Uh, but it isn't more than that. Competition is a relationship between formally equals, uh, but also materially or actually uh, unequals. But it is more by the same token, it is a system of dominance or force even of violence once in a while. Who rules in capitalism? Well, capital, the capitalists, the capitalist class, or nobody. Nobody meaning a set of anonymous economic laws dominating everybody's lives and actions. Well, Marx's answer to that uh, is quite complex and complicated. Capitalism is not, as some people today would like to have it, just impersonal rule. You can say so if you compare it to pre-capitalist systems of production and exchange, uh, but it's more than that. Uh, in Marx's formula, the anarchy of the markets where economic laws prevail goes together with despotism of capital or despotism of individual capitalism and even with the rule of the capitalist class. There is, again, one of the findings of Marx, conceptually, there is no capital without capitalists, uh, as Marx had it, no rule of economic laws without the permanent interaction of individual capitalists and many others, wage laborers and other economic actors. There is no silent force of economic laws or economic relations within this system without also uh, a relationship of class rule. Sixth, uh, Marx does not tell us how capitalism will end. There are some uh, celebrities today who think they can tell us exactly how that works. Not, that is not very convincing. Uh, Marx never spoke about a catastrophe or a collapse of modern capitalism. He was far too cautious to do something like that. There are only the tendencies inherent in modern capitalism, which will provoke always and always have provoked in the past and will do so in the future, social counter movements, reactions, revolts in all uh, forms again and again. And with respect to these tendencies, Marx's theory of capitalism is still superior. I will just pinpoint some of them, do not go through all of it. For instance, there's a tendency towards commodification, which means a transformation of everything into marketable commodities, uh, which implies a permanent struggle about uh, uh, over the, the limits of the realm of commodities and markets. The market is contested terrain. And there are a lot of uh, non-commodities in modern society, modern, in modern capitalism that still exists, but the limits between them and the ever-expanding realm of the market is and remains contested terrain. Uh, there is proletarianization on a world scale uh, in various forms uh, and in uh, forms that always go back 
and sometimes reproduce elements of the early times and even of pre-capitalist uh, times. This is one of the problems also in Marx. He thinks that in the long run, capitalism with free wage laborers will prevail everywhere, which is historically not completely true. Uh, capitalism has existed for very long time also with un forms of unfree labor. And it is not easy to integrate this historical fact, fact into Marx's analysis of capitalism. There is Michael, time, time to finish, please. Okay, I'll finish. Uh, there is the creation of a world market. Uh, there is the ex uh, continuing expansion of the realm of capitalism. There are crises and cycles uh, as a dominant form of motion of capitalist uh, economies. There is an increasing waste of human labor. Uh, there is an increase of, of the destruction of and eventually undermining of the natural and social basis of capitalism. In short, to use Rosa Luxemburg's apt formulation, Marx's theory is in its core a theory of capitalist development, not just of capitalist structure. So it's both. Um, and capitalism throughout this, its development undergoes many transformations some of which can be called revolutions. So uh, there are revolutions within capitalism, quite a lot of them, not only industrial, but also commercial, financial, technological, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Not all the tendencies that Marx uh, has in mind and that he has formulated prevail. For instance, uh, some of the so-called laws most cherished by many Marxists, uh, although Marx had serious second thoughts about them, like the infamous law of the falling rate of profit, are highly debatable or not, even, not relevant at all uh, in order to understand uh, actual and previous capitalist uh, devel uh, developments of capitalism. Last remark on the revival. Marx has left his theory of capitalism unfinished also, although many Marxists don't like this idea, but it is a simple fact, well established. Uh, any revival depends upon accepting the Marxian problem. So what is unsolved, what is unsettled uh, within the framework of Marx theory of capitalism as a core part of his legacy and to work on it a revival of Marx's critique of political economy, which is still his greatest and his long, lifelong project requires to take his unfinished work seriously and to drop some of the arrows most dear to many Marxists. Marx theory of capitalism is not an exercise in social philosophy, and it's not a contribution to political theory proper. It is still the best we have, and it's still the starting point for a revival of political economy. Thank you very much for your patience and uh, attention. Michael, thank you very, very much. I very much enjoyed your presentation as always. You've been a little bit naughty with the time, eh? but yeah, so uh, one, the most beautiful background scenario. So you have the first um, uh, place so far, so you got a few minutes more. Thank you. The third speaker, I better be as uh, uh, fast, as quick as possible, is Heather Brown. So we go back to um, the other side of the Atlantic. She teaches political science at uh, Westfield State University, and she's the author of a, a very good book um, that has circulated a lot in the um, last um, decade. The book was published in 2012, Marx on Gender and the Feminine Critical Study. And Heather Brown is also the author of Gender Equality, the chapter Gender Equality in the Marx Revival. Heather, 15 minutes for you as well. Are you there? The floor uh, is yes. yours. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, talking, uh, as was mentioned a little bit today, on the issue of gender equality, and uh, much of this, I think, relates back, and we've seen it in current events, to uh, the family and this uh, um, conservative turn in, in many countries, particularly the U.S., to uh, sort of a traditional family, something that uh, Marx uh, rallies against quite a bit uh, in many of his works. Uh, so 
in his early writings, uh, Marx exhibited a great deal of concern for the position of women within capitalist society. In fact, the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844, Marx made possibly the strongest statement for gender equality anywhere in his work, uh, arguing that humanity's development can be measured by the relationship between men and women. And uh, I'll read out this long quote because I think it's uh, fairly significant. Uh, the direct, natural, necessary relation of person to person is the relation of man to woman. And this natural species relationship, man's relation to nature is immediately his relation to man, just as his relation to man is immediately his relation to nature, his own natural destination. And this relationship, therefore, is sensuously manifested, uh, reduced to an observable fact, the extent to which the human essence has become the nature of man or to which the nature of man has become human essence of man. From this relationship, one can therefore judge man's whole level of development. From the character of this relationship follows how much man as a species being, as man has come to himself to comprehend himself. The relation of man to woman is the most natural relation of human being to human being. It therefore reveals the extent to which man's natural behavior has become human extent to which uh, human essence in him has become a natural essence, the extent to which his human nature has become natural for him. This relationship also reveals the extent to which man's need has become human need, the extent to which, therefore, the other person as a person has become for him a human need, the extent to which his individual existence is at the same time a social being. Uh, so a particular note is how Marx moves from the abstract universal the unmediated natural human understanding of species being where survival and thus reproduction is the primary link between individuals to the concrete universal understanding of natural uh, where every human being regardless uh, of gender are both beings for themselves and for others. Uh, the individual is valued both in terms of who they are and what they become as well as being representative of the species being. Thus women and men become valuable to others not just for instrumental purposes, but simply because they are human beings with similar needs and wants. Uh, Marx was concerned with the repressive relationships for women within the family uh, in his own time and called for the family's transformation into a more egalitarian institution. In his 18, uh, 1846 piece uh, for Mirror of Society uh, titled Duchet on Suicide, he took up suicide in his relationship to alienation for the first and only time in this published work. Marx used this bourgeois Frenchman to illustrate that a simple betterment of the working class position would not be enough. In fact, all of society faced some level of alienation. This text, uh, Marx writes, may show what grounds there are for the idea of the philanth philanthropic bourgeois that is only a question of a li little bread, a little education for the proletarians, that the worker is stunted in the present state of society but otherwise existing in the best of all possible worlds. Marx placed emphasis on the bourgeois family as a source of repression, where familiar, familial tyrannies, quote, cause crises analogous to revolutions. Important to emphasize that three of the four cases that he exerted uh, discuss women's suicide, all in relation to familial and gender repression. And furthermore, that fourth case study was in its own way a, a case study on gender. The only case dealing with uh, a male suicide, even though it was more common at the time that Marx takes up is one where a male family member lost his job, can no longer support the family and play that role as uh, the, the pater famous. Um, and another instance, he deals with an issue of a woman who is uh, unable to obtain an abortion um, and commit suicide as a result, uh, very much in keeping with uh, uh, current events uh, re relative to the US today and very relevant. In the uh, final instance I'll discuss here, uh, a woman was publicly ridiculed for spending the night at her fiance's house. Here, Mark strongly chided the family institution and the seemingly moral authority that supported it and noted that this abuse of power stemmed from the powerlessness of many in public life. He writes, the most cowardly, unresisting people become implacable as soon as they can exercise absolute parental authority. The abuse of this authority is a cruel compensation for all the submissiveness and dependence to which they abase themselves in bourgeois society. Uh, moving to some of uh, Marx's 
uh, latest writings, uh, the ethnological notebooks written in the 1880s, uh, not intended for publication, but still provide a wealth of interesting material in relation to gender in the family from late in his life. Like Lewis Henry Morgan, Marx was quite critical of many ethnologists of the day that uh, held to the notion of the origin of family uh, coming from the patriarchal family. Marx read and appropriated much of Morgan's understanding from ancient society. Morgan had argued that the Iroquois of his day represented one stage in the unilinear development of the human family. Mother right as it existed for the Iroquois, for example, was an earlier stage of clan and social life where women had more rights. Family was not always hierarchical and patriarchal, according to Morgan, and uh, Marx tended to agree with that. Uh, in other parts of his notes, Marx appropriated Morgan in theoretical disputes with uh, Henry Sumner Main's lectures on the early history of institutions from 1875. Throughout his notes, Marx criticized Maine for his failure to understand the importance of the clan in early societies, as well as a general lack of understanding of the modalities of change in these societies. He rebuked Maine's argument that the patriarchal joint family, which existed in certain parts of India at the time, was one of the earliest forms of the family, referring to him one point as a blockheaded Englishman. And uh, to get more into the, the details of what he was saying here, uh, he writes the entirely false uh, representation of Maine that the private family, even in the form which exists in India, can be regarded as a basis which the sept and gens evolved, etc., is shown in the following passage. After he says the power of distributing inheritances vested in the Celtic chiefs is the same institution reserved to the Hindu father in the Mikshara, he continues, it is part of the prerogative of the idiot who misses the relationship between the gens and the tribe belonging to the representative of the purest blood in the joint family. When the proportion of the joint family, the sept or the gens becomes artificial, the power and distribution tends more and more uh, to look like administrative authority. The matter is quite the reverse. Uh, so Marx here charged that Maine was generalizing the existence of the, patri of the private family based on one form of the family uh, from mm -hmm. India's past that occurred under unique circumstances. Uh, he thinks there's not enough evidence to make the assertion that the clan evolved from the private family. And uh, there is proof even within Maine's work itself, uh, contrary to Maine's discussion about inheritance rights in India. Uh, Marx also takes up the issue of gender uh, in Capital, uh, Volume 1, uh, returning to his discussion on what you would see as the transformation of the family. As capitalistic organization of industry spread to areas previously occupied by domestic industry and helped create further ground for the dissolution of the family, came necessary to regulate, uh, quote, the so-called home labor, end quote, um, since it is immediately viewed as a direct attack on parental authority. Marx wrote that the barriers once in place to separate public and private spheres were being broken down through the incorporation of women and, ch and children's labor into industry outside of control of the head of the household. The state had to at least take over regulation of some aspects of that, uh, often doing so quite reluctantly. Uh, Marx argued, however, that this form of exploitation and destruction of the family is, also had some potentially positive effects. He writes, however terrible in discussing the dissolution under the capitalist system of the old family tide may appear Nonetheless, industry by assigning as it does an important part in the process of production outside of the domestic sphere to women, uh, to young persons and to children of both sexes, it creates a new foundation for a higher form of the family and relation between the sexes. Moreover, it's obvious that the fact of a collective working group being compromised by individuals of both sexes and all ages must necessarily under suitable conditions become a source of humane development. Although in a spontaneously developed brutal capitalistic form where laborer exists for the process of production, not the process of production for the laborer, that fact is a pestiferous source of corruption and slavery, end quote. It appears that Marx is summarizing much of his previous argument regarding capitalism and the effects on the family. All ties based upon the economic system in which most production occurred within the domestic sphere had begun to dissolve as it became more industrially based. Although production does not determine, but only conditions the form of the family, these changes in the production of the means of life had a significant effect on the ability of the patriarchal family to function 
and create grounds for both the harsh exploitation of new workers under capitalism, as well as future non-exploitative forms of the family. While this is an admittedly brief and abstract discussion of the potential changes in family structure, it's important to note that Marx posited this change occurring as a result of cooperation of all workers, including women and children. Marx was, Marx was not questioning the introduction of women into the workforce, let alone calling for a family wage. Instead, he pointed to the ways in which uh, the, quote, spontaneously developed brutal capitalist form, the system works against the humane development of workers, end quote. Equally significant is his dialectical discussion of how these developments under the right circumstances could be transformed into their opposite as a new form of the family. Uh, finally, Marx took up issues of gender in uh, critique of the Gotha program, where the 1840, uh, sorry, 1875 uh, party platform of the German Social Democratic Party that was heavily influenced by Lasallian and formist ideas, he spoke of the need for, quote, fair distribution of the proceeds of labor. Marx noted, is not, uh, noted that the mere distribution could only be measured based on the form of society in question and not in terms of abstract concepts of justice. Those in power would always claim the present distribution is just. One of the examples that Marx uses uh, in his discussion of problems with using the bourgeois concept of right in new society involved the distribution of labor and a family and how this could lead to unequal distribution overall. He writes, beside one more one worker is married, another not. One has more children than another, et cetera, et cetera. Thus, given the equal amount of work done, hence the equal share of the societal consumption fund, one will in fact receive more than another. One will be richer than another, et cetera. To avoid these defects, right would have to be unequal rather than equal. While it's not fully clear that Marx was discussing the value of domestic labor, there appears to be an opening for a critical angle. Domestic labor does not have exchange value since it is labor done in the home, but it does have an important use value. So it has to be available to do the cooking, cleaning, raising children, etc. Those that live alone have to do these things in addition to their own labor in the public sphere. Thus there be need to rethink uh, the private public distinction in new society. Marx showed considerable insight into gender relations of his own time, pointing to the need for a total transformation of society that would necessarily involve new relations between men and women. Marx's work, this work is not without problems, however. He was not always able to overcome the Victorianism of his own era and at times reverted to a naturalistic understanding of gender. Regardless, Marx's innovative theory of gender was already quite evident in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, where he provided an incipient philosophy of gender and society as much potential for overcoming the hierarchical dualisms that impeded uh, gender equality. Later as he moved to political economy, this philosophical grounding remained. Marx seemed to point in the uh, direction of a fully dialectical understanding of entry of women into the workforce, as well as the contradictions and opportunities that this provided. His sensitivity to the plight of all women illustrated the need to surpass the boundaries of liberalism. Marx's ethnological notebooks led to the new and theoretically stimulated, uh, stimulating directions in his thinking on family relations and gender equality pointing to these areas, not as static categories that simply change with new economic circumstances, but as dyna dynamic dialectical factors that interact with economic forces. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather Brown. Perfectly timed in 15 minutes. Um, and there will be, of course, questions and comments soon in the Q&A. And now we go back to the, um, now we go to the last two speakers uh, Michael Lowy and Peter This The next one is Michael from um, Paris. Um, Michael Lowy is Emeritus Research Director at the French National Center for Scientific Research. Like Bob Jessop, too much prolific to be, um, you know, to summarize his uh, many writings and books in a few seconds. But I want to mention his most recent um, book, very nice, very short one, wonderful, written with uh, Olivier Besancenot. Oh, the title is Marx in Paris, 1871, Jenny's Blue Notebooks, published with the uh, High Market. Michael, are you there? 15 minutes for you. Thank you. Well, I would like to start by thanking uh, Marcello Musto because he has the rare gift of bringing together Marxists from all around the world. Yeah, so this is uh, something quite uh, 
uh, to be uh, noted. Well, of course, it's a completely impossible task to summarize Marx's theory of revolution in 50 minutes, but okay, let's play the game according to the rules. I will follow a chronological order. That's the way I, I do things. So let's start mid 1844, when the young Marx, who was a left new Hegelian, wrote his first piece where he speaks about proletarian revolution, which is the well-known uh, introduction to the critique of the philosophy of right of Hegel, which he published in the Deutsch Französische Jahrbücher, uh, German French yearbook uh, at early 1844. And as a typical neo Hegelian, he thought that revolution is, first of all, a philosophical issue. So he writes revolution begins in the head of the philosopher, and then it seizes the masses, yeah? the proletarian masses. And the proletarian masses are so the the, the philosophy is the active element, and the masses are the passive element, which is moved by the spirit and of uh, critical philosophy, of revolutionary philosophy. So that, that was the, the first approach, which was, as I said, typical idealist, that's new, left New Hegel. But very soon, Marx would, would change his approach. Yeah? First of all, because he started to know more about the working class, the proletariat, the communist currents by uh, contact with the workers, uh, the communist workers in Paris, but above all, because something which happened in Germany, the first uprising of the German proletariat, the uprising of the Silesian weavers, the Silesian weavers in June 1844. I cannot develop, but it was an important uprising. And Marx wrote something about this, a piece in a leftist German journal published in Paris, which is called uh, Marginal Notes on the Nazi, etc., etc., et, cetera, et cetera, where he writes the following, which is very important. About this surprising, yeah? we see in Germany, he says, he says that a philosophical people can find its corresponding praxis in socialism. And only in the proletariat can it, the people, find the active element of the emancipation. So you see the, the very big change. Yeah? Now, uh, socialism is not philosophy theory, it's a praxis. Yeah? And uh, people and philosophy are not separated. The people is philosophical. Yes. <laughs> so to say, and uh, the proletariat is not a passive, but the active uh, element of the emancipation. So it, it was a, a very, very substantial change, which then will be translated in philosophical and political terms in the thesis on Feuerbach in 1845, and particularly in the German ideology from 1846. And let me just read two passages from the German ideology, which summarize this new concept of revolution in uh, Young Marx, huh? 1846. Says Marx, and in, in uh, the German ideology, both for the production on a mass scale of communist consciousness and for the success of the cause itself, communism, the alteration of human beings on a mass scale is necessary, which can take only place in a practical movement, a revolution. The revolution is necessary, not only because the ruling class cannot be overthrown in any other way, but also because the class overthrowing it, the proletariat, can only in a revolution succeed in ridding itself of all the muck of ages and become fitted to found society anew. In revolution activity, the changing of oneself coincides with the changing of circumstances. This is the gist of Marx's philosophy of praxis, which is a theory about revolutionary activity. Yeah? And so the conclusion for Marx is that 
revolution can only take the form of the self-emancipation of the revolutionary class. And this is a very important principle as I will try to show. Yeah. Um, and a few years later then Marx in the Communist Manifesto summarized this new conception of revolution saying, I quote again from the Communist Manifesto, all previous historical movements were movements of minorities or in the interest of minorities. The proletarian movement is a self-conscious independent movement of the immense majority in the interest of the immense majority. So that's the new concept of revolution, seen now not as a conspiracy of a revolutionary elite, but as a process of revolutionary self-emancipation of the proletariat of the oppressed classes, which are the immense majority. So this, uh, let's say, is the new concept of revolution, uh, we, which is the political expression of Marx's philosophy of praxis, yes, as it is formulated in his early writings. Now, uh, Marx's uh, first participation in a real revolution took place, as we know, in 1848, when he and uh, Engels were present uh, in the German Revolution, in Frankfurt, etc., publishing the, the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, etc. But soon the revolution was defeated, they were persecuted, and went into exile in uh, England but they continued to be in contact with their comrades of the Communist League. And in March, 1850, Marx and Engels wrote a very interesting document, on, interesting from the point of view of revolutionary theory, uh, which is a circular letter from Marx and Engels to the, co the militant the activists of the Communist League, which were still in Germany, about the prospects of the revolution in Germany on March 1850. And what are they saying? What are they writing? It's recommendations. What should be done yeah, in order to uh, per permit the, the revolution to move forward? Yeah? They say, for instance, uh, alongside the new official government in Germany, the workers must immediately establish their own revolutionary workers' government. And while the democratic petty bourgeois wish to bring the revolution to a conclusion as quickly as possible, it is our interest and our task to make the revolution permanent until our more or less possessing classes have been forced out of their position of dominance, the proletariat has conquered power. Yeah? So this is the idea of permanent revolution. That means that in a backward country, because Germany in at that time was a semi-feudal, monarchic, economically backward country. Uh, the revolution can only triumph if it, the democratic revolution transforms itself in a proletarian, in a socialist revolution. Yeah? So this is a, the idea of permanent revolution. Of course, Marx and Engels were wrong because nothing like this happened in Germany. In fact, the revolution had been already defeated but it was a kind of brilliant insight of how things would happen in the 20th century, particularly in the Russian Revolution. Yeah? Because in the Russian Revolution, this is what happened. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah? The workers formed their own uh, revolutionary workers' government. They uh, went beyond a, the democratic revolution into a proletarian socialist world, et cetera. Et cetera. So this is very, very a very interesting insight, but of course, uh, in the concrete conjuncture, it was wrong. Now, uh, when later when Marx became one of the founders of the First International, he was asked by the workers of the First International to write a preamble for the stat statute of the First International. And here he wrote a famous phrase, which summarized the concept of revolution. Yeah? The emancipation of the working classes must be achieved by the working classes themselves. Yeah? This is 
the basic principle, as I have been emphasized, of the self-emancipation of the oppressed. And of course, the first expression, the concrete political expression of this was the Paris Commune, yeah? was the Paris Commune as the great modern revolutionary movement of self-emancipation of the proletariat, a revolution which would, uh, which uh, did, as Marx explained, not conquer the state apparatus, but smashed it and tried to create something. Uh, new. Yeah, I'm not going to develop because Bob Jessup has already talked about this, so I don't need to go into this story. Well, after the defeat of the Paris Commune, uh, Marx and Engels were very much linked to the German Social Democratic Party, whose leaders like Bebel, etc., were referred to, to Marx uh, theory. But at the same time, they had some criticism. Yeah. Uh, because they were worried that uh, there were revisionist currents inside the German social democracies, which they criticized because they denied the principle of self-emancipation of the work class. They believed that the workers have to be emancipated by uh, the, uh, let's say, <clears throat> the philanthropic members of the upper and lower middle classes. Yeah? That's what Engels and Marx wrote in a letter to their social, to their friends, leaders of the Social Democratic Party, criticizing uh, this uh, revisionist current. Now, uh, I'm coming now to the last Marx, which was, the, as you know, the object of a book by Marcelo Mosto, the last Marx, and particularly his last writings about the Russian Revolution, which I think are very, very important. I refer, first of all, to a letter he wrote to a Russian revolutionary called Vera Tsulich, where he discusses the issue of the Russian uh, peasant community, the traditional Russian peasant community, which had a, a collectivistic tradition, yeah? a kind of primitive communism. And Marx writes in this letter that he thinks that these rural communities collectivist traditions in Russia could be the starting point for a revolutionary development in Russia, a socialist revolutionary development in Russia, which would permit to the Russian people to escape yes, all the horrors of capitalist development. Yeah? Kind of shortcut between a country what was still semi-feudal, absolutist with uh, only the beginning of capitalism, that Russia wouldn't have to need to go all through this, the stages of that development of capitalism of England, for instance, but thanks to these collectivist traditions of the peasantry could go in a socialist direction. And Marx and Engels would repeat this idea in the introduction they wrote for the Russian uh, translation of the Communist Manifesto, all this in 1881. So just two years before Marx then. Yeah? And in this introduction to the Russian edition of the Communist Manifesto, they say that a revolution in Russia could sound the sign, the signal for a proletarian revolution in the West, in Western Europe. And thanks to this, the prevailing form of communal ownership of land among the Russian peasants might be the starting point for a communist course of development in Russia. Yeah. Now, we can discuss if this is what, or not what happened in Russia, but anyhow, it showed that Marx was not the kind of Eurocentric economic determinist that believed that revolution must begin in England because it's the most advanced capitalist country, but on the contrary, he believed revolution can begin in a peripheric country, a less, much less developed country, a semi-feudal country, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then expand to the other more developed countries. Yeah? And based on the collectivist traditions of the peasantry. It's an interesting insight. And much of what happened with the revolutions in the 20th century 
has to do with these insights of Marx. Yeah, because most of the revolution, including the Russian Revolution, which took place in a peripheric country, backward country, uh, where the peasants played a very important role. Of course, the leadership was proletarian. And also the other revolutions of the 20th century, the Cuban, the Vietnamese, the, the Chinese revolution, etc., all have something to do with what Marx, this insight of Marx in his writings, uh, in his late, late writings on, on Russia. Huh? Now, uh, if the I have two minutes more, I would say one word about the Marxist theory of revolution after Marx today, eh? let's say. I think the Marxist theory of revolution is very much relevant today. The basic idea of revolution as self-emancipation of the press is still a very, very relevant, but there we have something new in our times, 21st century, which is the ecological uh, catastrophe. Yeah? This is a new challenge. And this is why I believe, I'm not the only one, that the revolution today, if we think about revolution today, it has to be both a social and an ecological revolution. Of course, Marx had some important ecological insight, as my friend Bellamy Foster has shown, but still it was not a central issue for him. Yeah? It was not a decisive issue at his time. Yeah? So as it is for us today, yeah, for us today, ecology, the destruction of the environment by capitalism and the threat to human life by this process of capitalist destruction, the danger of a ecological catastrophe by climate change is something new. And therefore the understanding we have of what is revolution, because revolution has, is not only a social, but also an ecological revolution, which means a radical break with the principles of the modern capitalist industrial civilization. I think this is a, some, a new insight which we have to develop starting from the Marxist theory of revolution, but considering the new conditions. Merci beaucoup. Michael, many, many thanks to you um, for this wonderful presentation, as always, also for the very kind words <clears throat> uh, related to, um, to me. And um, also, I want to remind that uh, Michael Lowe with the TN Balibar and a couple of other colleagues, uh, we have done a wonderful and very useful roundtable interview on war that will appear next week, will be published next week by Jacobin, and then will be translated by into many other languages. So. I'm looking forward to sharing this with the um, Left Forum Network and many more comrades. I also wanted to invite people to put their questions in the chat because in 15 minutes, we will start the q and I've already three questions. There is uh, still a little bit of um, room for more. And now is the time to go to the next speaker. Uh, Back to the United States in Chicago, my friend Peter Hood is professor of philosophy and humanities at uh, Walkton Community College. <clears throat> Peter is uh, author of many, many wonderful, very interesting publications. I will just uh, remember Marx's concept of the alternative to capitalism published in 2012. And also I must remember the wonderful work that he does with uh, David Norman Smith and many other colleagues about um, Rosa Luxemburg and you know editing his work into English. So Peter, you wrote about political organization, it was a very wonderful chapter, and I'm sure that this will be a very interesting presentation for all of us, 50 minutes for you. Oh, thank you very much, Marcelo, for putting this together and indeed for helping the, for putting this book together. Uh, my chapter, as Marcelo just said, deals with a relatively untheorized dimension of Marx's legacy, his concept and practice of revolutionary organization. There are two general reasons, I think, for this neglect. The first is the widespread assumption, which was predominant already during Marx's lifetime, but certainly even more so afterwards, that Marx's contribution was that of a theoretician, especially a critic of political economy, of course, but not a revolutionary organizer. And since he never developed a theory of organization, Virtually all socialists from Marx's time to our own have tended to turn to other figures for guidance when it comes to matters of organization. Second, and relatedly, uh, in the 20th century, 
numerous post-Marx Marxists, most especially Lenin, developed theories of organization of their own that gained considerable notoriety, whether positively or negatively appraised, which tended to overshadow any consideration of Marx's own contribution to the subject. So my chapter seeks to challenge both of these approaches by arguing that Marx developed a distinctive concept of organization that has greater relevance for today, actually, than its 20th century variants after Marx's death. So to do so, I want to single out for here just four crucial dimensions of Marx's concept of political organization as I see it. First, Marx never supported the idea that the seizure of state power and the transition to socialism could be achieved by a party that lacks majoritarian support among the working class, regardless of whether that party was led by an enlightened intellectual elite or not. He consistently argued that socialism could only arise through the self-conscious independent movement of the immense majority in the interest of the immense majority. Hence, before, during, and right after the 1848 revolutions and elsewhere, Marx held that the relatively small size of the industrial proletariat at the time, as well as the lack of broad support for socialist and communist parties in general in Europe, required revolutionaries to push the liberal bourgeoisie as far as possible to the left by demanding the creation of a democratic republic. From then to the end of his life, he never wavered from the view that a democratic republic is the form best suited for waging the class struggle to a successful conclusion, including when he called for the revolution to be continued in permanence. And that's because he held that the democratic republic provides the best conditions for a political party, a proletarian political party, to win the majority support of its class. Now, Marx had many occasions to polemicize against tendencies from as early as the Communist League on up on through his life that advocated in one form or another seizing power in the name of socialism or communism that lacked such broad majoritarian working class support. Now, that did not mean that he held that a communist seizure of power could not or should not occur where the working class or especially the industrial working class constitutes a minority of the populace. It need not be the numerical majority so long as it serves as the leading force that brings other social forces, such as sections of the petty bourgeoisie and especially the peasantry onto the side of the revolution. That is why Marx emphatically rejected Ferdinand LaSalle's view, which uh, was picked up and approved of and voiced by Marx's own followers in the Gotha program of 1875, that stated that compared to the working class, I'm quoting from the Gopta program, and it's a famous phrase from LaSalle himself, compared to the working class, all other forces in society are one reactionary mass. This is a conception which Marx viciously opposed, strongly opposed, and thought was a complete uh, non-starter in, in, for any kind of uh, revolutionary political organization in the context of the time. Second, Marx nowhere speaks of the need for a single centralized vanguard party to lead the revolution. The Communist Manifesto instead states, and I quote, the communists do not form a separate party opposed to other working class parties, end quote. The U case that a single socialist or communist party must represent a given national entity was a creation of the second international. And that was subsequently passed to the third international, which adopted that U case and pushed it even to a stronger um, level, both of which owed far more, the second and third international, to LaSalle's, Ferdinand LaSalle's concepts of organization than to Marx, which I try to trace out in detail in my chapter. Third, Marx opposed parties structured along hierarchical lines in which the division between mental and manual labor, which he considered the hallmark of class society, becomes reproduced, intentionally or unintentionally. And you have to keep in mind that left-wing political parties from the early to the mid 19th century um, and right forward onward beyond that, right into the 20th century, generally followed the form of bourgeois party formations. The political parties are formation of bourgeois society in the early 19th century, despite their radically different political content. That is intellectuals, professionals, even at times lawyers, et cetera, provided the leadership and Rank and file workers, for the most part, carried out the mandates. Now, this is to be expected. The party formation 
has served as the organizing principle of the bourgeois state by the early no, 19th century. Um, and hence, um, the dialectic of the party is the dialectic of the bourgeois state. And this is no less true of left-wing parties, which may oppose that state, which nevertheless tend to consciously or unconsciously copy or mimic many aspects of its form. Hence, what easily becomes rendered invisible is the extent to which anti-capitalist parties can be saturated with the muck of class society, beginning with that separation between those who think and decide versus those who act and execute. Now, Marx took, often took issue with intellectuals who failed to question or surrender such prerogatives uh, that he held tend to get in the way of the self-emancipation of the working class. I can mention a couple of names here. Of course, the obvious ones, we can talk about Proudhon, we can talk about LaSalle, we can talk about a number of other figures, but three others that are important to keep in mind, Bernstein, Kautsky, Plekhanov. Marx got to know all them, okay? Uh, didn't meet Plekhanov, but he definitely knew Bernstein well, uh, and Kautsky he had an encounter with, and Plekhanov, of course, at the very end of his life. And let me just be genteel about it to say that he didn't exactly have, he was not impressed. And <laughs> he had some pretty critical things to say about all three of them on this question of a kind of um, a haughty attitude or even a philanthropic attitude uh, towards the working classes intellectuals. And Plekhanov's case, sitting in Switzerland writing his theses while the real revolutionaries, the populists were out there doing something to try to bring down the czarist regime. As he wrote in 1868, and this was actually written to the head of La the LaSallean organization, uh, which is after all, LaSalle created the first independent working class political party, independent political party in German history, uh, and hence his renown uh, for many decades afterwards. He writes in 1868 to Schweitzer, quote, and quoting Marx, a centralist organization would not be desirable in Germany where the worker is regulated bureaucratically. The main thing is to teach him to walk by himself. Fourth, this did not mean that Marx denied a, piv a pivotal role for intellectuals. He spells it out in the Manif Communist Manifesto by writing, and I quote again, that communists merely express in general terms the ultimate results of the future of that movement, namely the goal of a socialist or a communist society. So the deep-seated dogma that Marx never thought about or committed himself to any specific discussion of a post-capitalist society, which as I've argued in various contexts is actually simply not empirically accurate, has tended to bury from view the most important aspect of his concept of organization, namely the responsibility of a revolutionary party or organization of some type to provide insight into what is socialism as a political question, as a theoretical question. It's a practical question. What is socialism? Now, the fullest expression we find of this is, of course, the critique of the Gotham program of 1875, where he takes sharp, sharp issues, a sharp issue with his own followers, uh, because, as he states, this is what he states in the critique, I'm again quoting Marx, the program, the Gotha program, does not deal with the future body politic, Staatswesen, of communist society, end quote. The program does not deal with the future body politic of communist society. He then proceeds to issue uh, the most detailed outline that he ever penned uh, of him concerning the possible nature of a socialist or communist society that abolishes uh, value production and the law of value. Now, Marx so strongly opposed the Gotha program, which became the organizational hallmark and basis of the German social democracy, that SP Day was not existing in that form as of 1875, but the Gotha program, Gotha program is essentially uh, the organizational foundation of post-Marx Marxism uh, of the second international and to a large degree, uh, the third. Um, it became the organizational basis of, this, uh, of, of German socialists after 1875. And in 1875, nevertheless, he threatened to break off relations uh, with those who had agreed to its, um, uh, uh, the party unity based on that uh, program. He decides not to do so, but he nevertheless, for the rest of his life, keeps a rather distance from it, which indicates that even when there is no existing party to identify with, there is still what Marx called um, 
earlier in his career, in 1860, the party in the eminent historical sense. That is, party does not simply mean for Marx the physical existence of a political grouping whose central aim is the seizure of state power. Although, of course, Marx was repeatedly involved in organizations that had that goal immediately, or organizations like the First International, which did not, but nevertheless, Marx saw as a critical organizational embodiment of the struggle for uh, against capitalist society, even though the First International was not, strictly speaking, a thoroughly anti-capitalist organization, okay? When Marx wanted to push it in that direction. Um, but the point is that, that um, even when there's no existing party to identify, there is what he called the party in the eminent historical sense, the kind of sense in which he says to Engels, you and I owe it, we owe it to the party to make sure that capital uh, is a, takes a coherent form. He was talking, there was no party at the time that he was involved in. The party meant the party in the eminent historical sense. That is the sense, in the sense of being responsible for an organized body of thought that one has to uh, commit to, regardless of whether or not there is an actual existing organization that hears its uh, prerogatives or hears its, its mission and aim and takes it up. Now, most commentators on Marx, I think, have failed to recognize that the 1875 critique, of which there's been a lot written, but most people curiously don't single out that it was written as part of an intervention in an organizational dispute. That's the most important part of the critique for me, is that he intervenes in an actual organizational dispute within the German movement in which he sharply attacks Lasallian concepts that later became central, albeit in different ways, uh, through the development of post-Marx Marxism. And this, the extent to which the permutation, permeate, the, how much Lasallian concepts of organization permeated, uh, not just the reformists of the Second International, the revolutionaries of the Second International, becomes rather obvious, I mean, by looking at the, the figure that Marcello just mentioned, uh, who I, of course, am dedicated to seeing her work, complete works being translated and published into English, Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg will sharply attack Lasalle and his economic theories, and rightly so, some brilliant analyses in the wage fund and iron war of wages, et cetera. Uh, but when it comes to the organizational issue, she never ceases to praise Lasalle and does not refer to a concept of organization in Marx, unfortunately. That was the standard view. Okay, so to conclude, today in the 21st century, the appeal of social democratic and Leninist models of organization uh, is over. Uh, these models of organization have been rejected by virtually all of the new social movements that have arisen over the past several decades, be it Occupy, the feminist movement, Black Lives Matter, the citizens movement currently underway in Chile, et cetera, where the party formation, while not rejected as such, is not seen as the fulcrum of social transformation and definitely not a vertical elitist hierarchical party that has traditionally uh, characterized many uh, left attempts at organization building. Now, the fact that many in these movements, as well as outside of them, have tended to turn away from Marxism because of its identification with the non-horizontal and centralized models of organization that define post-Marx Marxism makes it all the more important as I see it to recover Marx's concept of organization, which can speak to those searching for ways to battle the division between mental and manual labor in the very course of the fight for a new society. Because this was the dimension of Marx's concept of organization, I think, that's too easily missed, that you have to do something to break down the division of worker and intellectual, of mental and manual labor in the very course of the struggle for a new society in order to have any insurance that the seizure of power is going to lead to a progress in terms of breaking down the fundamental uh, nexus of class relations. What remains to be done, I think, is for Marxists to realize that the most important role of revolutionary organization today, given what all the water that's gone under the bridge, above all else, is to develop through direct engagement with the new social movements and with Marx's body of work as a whole, a philosophically grounded conception of what constitutes a viable alternative to capitalism, given the failure to create such a viable alternative of a socialist or communist society over the course of the past 100 years, which is of course the elephant in the room as it were and the weight upon our shoulders at all times. If we neglect articulating such an alternative, I think uh, it's more, more than likely that activism will spend itself 
in mere anti-imperialism and anti-capitalism without ever revealing what it is for. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. Perfect uh, 15 minutes. It's always a pleasure. <clears throat> you are a great speaker, you know. Just you and Michael Lowy made us perhaps a little bit sad because we have to talk about the revolution instead of making the revolution. <laughs> but, uh, that's, another, that's another issue. Thank you to all five of you. I have already five questions and um, I have already been in touch with um, um, people who are asking the questions and they will actually ask them live, but they will be very nice with me and they will try to condense them in 30 seconds because we don't have a lot of time. And after this, I will go back to the speakers for a couple of minutes each and we have to finish in 14 minutes. So it's very, very tight. The first one is Igor, Igor Scheukebrod. Igor, are you there? Yeah. All right, well, I'll do it right away. Uh, first to commend uh, Marcello Musto uh, for the wonderful edited collection and the contributors. I have to say right off the bat that I've already benefited from it by actively citing the work of uh, Michael Lowy in a forthcoming article. And we have a translation project on uh, Soviet legal theory called uh, the revolution of law. And my question concerns the the point about uh, revolution and impermanence, which Michael Lowy brought up, but it also came up, I think, wonderfully in Peter Kudis's remarks and basically in all the presentations. What does this concept mean beyond capitalism? Uh, what does it mean beyond capitalism, whether it's for the ecology, whether it's for questions of gender se uh, sexuality? Uh, what does it mean for political organization? Does the revolution stop beyond uh, capitalism? Or is it really a revolution in permanence? I'll keep it there to be fair to everyone else. Igor, many thanks. And we all know that you are one of the uh, author of the series, Marx and Angus Marxism. Your book was very successful, among the most sold. Second is Kialo Ieter. Kialo, are you there? Please. Yeah, I'm there. I'm there. On the question. So 30 seconds for you as well. Uh, yeah, I want to ask uh, Peter who is, and I, I have a very, very issue, big problem about this, like the state and the revolution. This, in this chapter, Lenin said that we need to uh, maintain a state, but this state means that the workers committee extra. But I want to see that if we really want to break the state, why we have to remain the state? I know that that state means a kind of things like element state and these two things element we need to break through we need to solve that that things but if this this element this alienated element become a structure we we the only thing we can do is to reform this if we want to break this structure we need to another revolution so my question is how we prevent this element become another state or something else and i think that neither the party nor the workers committee also need to their own transcendency to achieve this goal, but how we can do this? This is my problem. Thank you very much. The next one, Baba Kamini. Um, hello, uh, thank you very much for uh, organizing this uh, really interesting panel and of course the book. Uh, uh, so my question is uh, for uh, Bob Jezo. Um, I was wondering if, uh, uh, you see whether and if so how Marx linked uh, his analysis of state forms and the ways popular movements um, influence or influenced by these transformations in the in the in uh, state forms. Uh, whether he saw this relation always kind of external to each other, uh, or at least whether it has to be seen as it has to be external. Uh, I guess yeah, it's linked to uh, Peter Hudis' uh, presentation in terms of Marx's concept of of uh, political organizations and whether uh, you know for me uh, there's kind of relative dismissal of uh, Marx uh, with respect to the transformation or the movements that were happening in UK at the time uh, and his you know interest in the kind of more revolutionary movements in France or elsewhere in Europe that were kind of external to the state uh, is a curious point. And I was wondering if he really conceptualized this kind of reciprocal relation between state form and popular movement. 
Bye bye. Thank you very much. And the next on the list is my friend Bob Ware. Bob, you are a good friend of mine. Please, one minute for you. One minute and a half maximum. Thank you. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, yes. Now, yes. now am I right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for organizing a wonderful panel with. Uh, uh, such interesting uh, contributions. Uh, uh, it's uh, very helpful, I think. Uh, I could say a lot more. Let me to try to directly to raise some questions uh, uh, or raise one particular question about development. Uh, and it uh, began uh, with Bob Jessup's uh, re remark, uh, but uh, I, I think uh, development becomes an issue at various points. Uh, places where Marx uh, is dealing with problems. Uh, Bob talked about uh, the uh, uh, abolition of the state and who was it? someone who's just uh, commented on the withering away of the state. Uh, uh, the question that I have is to what extent was Marx uh, thinking about how uh, interactions and structures and human nature and so on would uh, develop uh, because of uh, the social revolution going along with the political revolutions, and to what extent would things just be abolished? Uh, and there's an interesting, this question uh, comes up in interesting ways in the manifesto in part two, where uh, it's, it's not very useful. There are a lot of uh, criticisms uh, of uh, Marx and Engels or the communists, but sometimes the word is uh, abschaffen, uh, and sometimes the word is uh, aufheben. Uh, and I gather, I'm not a specialist in uh, German, but I gather both are used to talk about uh, uh, abolition, that it would be no more, for example. Uh, or, but uh, for Marx and the Hegelian tradition that he uh, knew so well, uh, speaking about an aufhebung, uh, would be about transcendence and development. And uh, there are many places where I might talk about this, maybe two very quickly. Uh, uh, one is in the critique of the GoTo programs, uh, where uh, uh, he says that uh, there'll be analogous functions of uh, uh, the, what is it, the organization, it's not the organization, but there'd be analogous functions in societies in the future. Um, and we then have to look to see what those functions are. How would we? I don't know. There's another point in Engels in uh, uh, The Origin of the Family where he says, uh, how could we say anything about what sexual relations will be like uh, in the future amongst young people? And why would they listen to a couple old men like us uh, anyway? Uh, there'll be development of uh, sexual relations and uh, human relations. Um, and there'll be development of organizations and associations as well. Maybe we can know a bit about this. I don't know what Mark's thoughts uh, on this. They're very complex issues. And he uh, was a very complex, he thought very complex things. But I, I think it's a good thing to think about. Bob, thank you very much. Uh, Claudio, Claudio Coloma, would you like to jump in for Peter um, Rudis and Michael Lowy? Please, 30 seconds. Be nice with me. Thanks. Claudio, unmute, you, unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, Claudio, just a, a, a short question. Um, just your your thoughts or, or your relationships with post-Marxism, uh, Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouf, uh, because I, I see that that kind of, of Marx and Bini is absent of, from, from the debate and perhaps uh, the books doesn't address it at all. I, I haven't get the book yet, but I, I'd like to know some comments about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very kind. And finally, Senia, Senia Perunovic. Senia, the same. Unmute yourself in just 30 seconds, please. Thank you. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I, I would like to say a few words about the question how to understand Marx's praise of capitalism. I do not think that it is about praising civilizing tendencies. I do not. I think it's the opposite. Marx actually talks about the increased brutality 
increased tendencies of repression, increased levels of alienation. Um, so how to understand his praise of, of capitalism? I see the answer uh, um, in his position when he says, um, seeds of communism are in the capitalism. And it's not only in the usual way how we understand in the, that, uh, that position in, in the context of um, st uh, class struggle. I see it also when Marx uh, talks about the development, technological science development in capitalism, which is, which means actually uh, increasing productivity to the levels that are not known in the previous history or history we know. So what capitalism does is producing so much goods, so much wealth, which is pre precondition for the communist principle of life, which is from each according to his abilities to each according to his um, needs, right? Thank so you. that Thank is you, a condition and Thanks. capitalism. Thank you. Now, I just wanted to ask you because we have very, very, very limited time. Your question is very, very interesting, very clear. And I'm sure that Michael Kretke is not the only one, but you know, the perfect speaker to give you a very superficial answer because actually each of them, starting from Bob Jessop, they only have two minutes. Bob. Thank you, Sanya. Very, very kind. I apologize. Okay. Bob, you, there, you have to mute yourself. Bob, Bob Jessop first. Okay. Bob, you have to unmute yourself. I'm, I'm unmuting myself now. Wow. Okay, wow. so Baba Kamini's question, first of all, and then Bob Ware's. So what's the relationship between the state form and popular struggle? And I think we can refer here again to uh, Mikhail Krekka's reference to capital, where Marx says the capital is not a thing, but a relationship between people mediated through the instrumentality of things. And Nikos Poulanzas argued that the state is not a thing, but it's a social relationship. And the, the key question that um, Poulanzas, Gramsci and others brought out is that we have to analyze the state as a social relation in terms of three forms of struggle. Struggles over the form of the state, struggles to change the content of the state, and the importance of struggles at a distance from the state. And Marx analyzed struggles at a distance from the state in terms of popular movements. And in this sense, we could say it's dialectical or reciprocal. In terms of Bob Ware's discussion of the Aufhebung or Abschaffung of the state, I think what's important here is that Marx argues the dictatorship of the proletariat would abolish the alienated forms of the state based on the institutional separation of state and society or the market and society. And for Marx, What's important is that working class emancipation takes place through the emancipation of the free time that workers have rather than the necessary time that they have in the labor process. So what we're talking about is the expansion of politics as Gemeinwesen rather than Staatswesen and the ways in which by taking part in popular struggles, the social emancipation is the key to that happening. And that's my two minutes up. So I'll pass over to your next uh, speaker. Bob, excellent. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Michael Kretke, but he will be penalized because he spoke more than anybody else. So he has only 90 seconds and on 120. Please, Michael. Okay. So when Marx praises capitalism, he does not do so without uh, second thoughts and without irony, it's always double, it's um, ambiguous. Uh, he is at various occasions saying exactly that, capitalism is a civilizing force, among other things, because it is paving the way for other, higher, better forms of society and economy. 
uh, he sees in very uh, well normal forms of capitalism of today, like joint stock uh, societies, joint stock companies, he sees an element of Vergesellschaftung, socialization of capital, collectivization of capital, you might say. He's exaggerating and you can see it in some points and then some years later he has second thoughts about it. So never forget, uh, this praise always comes together with a criticism of capitalism. But when you talk about his criticism, don't forget about uh, how he sees capitalism in, in its total as a civilizing and world-changing force. I stop there. Michael, thank you very much. Heather, would you like to add anything? There was not a question specific for you, but you are welcome to say something more if you want. Um, yeah, I'll uh, discuss a little bit uh, the, the question on uh, revolution and permanence and uh, related uh, because I think they are very much related. Um, that I, I spoke a little bit about that one Marx passage uh, from Critique of the Gotha program, talking a little bit about uh, this idea of equality and what that means uh, toward the family. And there I think he is pointing in the direction of greater human development that as things develop, we'll have a different understanding of what equality might look like. Um, and we can see that, for example, as uh, today we're dealing with the issue throughout much of the world, but uh, really prominent in uh, the United States and a few other countries of uh, you know, issues of things like what gender means overall, uh, whether it's a natural condition, whether it's a social condition, something in between um, issues that Marx and Engels wouldn't have thought about uh, given the time that they live in. So I think that idea uh, permeates a revolution of permanence continues after the revolution and we're uh, hopefully continually transforming uh, to higher levels of humanity. Wonderful, Peter, thank you very much. And um, the next one, Michael Lowy. Michael. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, um, yeah, per permanent revolution for Marx in 1850 in that circular letter I mentioned was basically the idea that in a country like Germany at the time, it was a backward monarchist semi-feudal country, there could not be a bourgeois democratic revolution. This would, would never happen. And the only way forward would be for the workers, together with the peasants and the other, the oppressed classes to develop a revolutionary process beyond the democratic limits of bourgeois or petty bourgeois democracy to a anti-bourgeois, anti-capitalist, proletarian or socialist revolution. Yeah, that was the idea, a permanent process without interruption. Yeah? And this process would extend then from Germany to the other countries, it would become international. Yeah? So he wouldn't believe that permanent revolution can be limited to one country. Now, after Marx, other Marxists took this idea, developed Leon Trotsky, for instance, and he would insist to emphasize that permanent revolution means that the revolution continues after the seizure of power by the proletarian forces in a permanent transformation of society, of family, for instance, putting an end to patriarchalism, it's a whole process, as Heather has mentioned, this is uh, an idea which was already present in Marx, but also other changes, it, abolition of the separation between intellectual and, and manual labor, etc. So society would continue to be in a process of permanent revolution after also the seizure of power. And today I would add, we would add, transformation, a, a radical transformation of the relation between society and nature. Yeah, in this process of permanent revolution, this would be a basic, a very, very decisive aspect. Michael, thank you very much. And see you in few days with the publication of our uh, roundtable interview on war. Finally, Peter Hudis. Peter, two minutes for you. Yes, in terms of Kialo's question, uh, yes, State and Revolution by Lenin's an important book uh, because he talks about, and he's the first Marxist after Marx to do this, he returns to the critique of the Gotha program and he says, hey, we haven't noticed, but now it's important to say, 
it's not taking over the existing state, but smashing the state, right? That's an important accomplishment in itself. But of course, it's a long story, but they didn't actually do that after seven, October 17. Yes, much of the existing state apparatus was taken over by the Bolsheviks. It was not completely smashed. Now you can make an argument that, well, but how could you do differently given the isolation, imperialist invasion? You can't make socialism in one country and Lenin certainly understood this. So you can let him slide perhaps a little bit on that in terms of state and revolution, not so much the practice afterwards. But the problem with state and revolution is a different one, I think. And that is that he identifies, the, 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 he conflates the dictatorship of the proletariat with the initial stage of socialism or communism, which by the way, he introduces a distinction, which is not in Marx, that there's a socialist stage of society followed by a communist phase of society. No such distinction is evident in any of Marx's work. And it's a relatively new idea when he was articulating it in 1917. And I think a dangerous one, because what it did is it introduced the state as an existing entity back into socialism, along with wage labor, where he says that in the first initial stage of socialism or communism, all employees become higher wage earners of the state, which means you don't abolish wage labor, which you get you with all kinds of problems. How do you exit from capitalism when you've got that perspective? Last point on um, the state. The critique, all English translations currently in existence of the critique of the Gotha program have Marx stating that what is the role of the state in the future communist society? He does not write this. This is a mistranslation. He does not use the term der Staat, the state. He uses Staatswesen, which could be translated more properly as functions associated with the state, but don't necessarily have to be part of an existing state. Uh, I'm involved in a new translation of the Critique of the Gothic program with a commentary by myself and Peter Lindbaugh that will be published in a couple of months by PM Press that's going to hopefully set the record straight on this. But I think we can never underestimate the extent to which all of us as well-meaning people don't always realize how much the debris of post-Marx Marxism informs our own lens in reading Marx and leaving certain things out. And then when we translate, putting certain things in that aren't there, okay, and that part of what the great work that Marcello has done putting forward this collection and many other that he works on is to be able to, you know, finally, we are the first generation that can hear Marx speak for himself as a whole. So that's a good place to start. <laughs> Peter, thank you very much. And I'm so glad that um, you ended this. Um, just an announcement, the Marx and Philosophy Review of Books is looking for a reviewer of the Marx Revival. Many reviews were published, many are forthcoming. Uh, so contact me if you want to do this review. And uh, I'm back to Kira and to Michael Lerner. Few minutes delay, but we did a very good uh, job today. The session was a little bit packed. Um, very interesting, I think. Michael, are you still there? You have to unmute yourself. Can you me, Marcello? Yes, just to say something in the end and you know the next I, announcement, I, I, I guess. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and very thanks important. Also Thank a very important know. other book was not mentioned today. And at the Marxist Education Project, we have a reading group every Monday. And there are about 16 people from many parts of the world coming to read Marcello's edited collection of Marx on alienation. And it's been it, meeting every week with people from various spots of the world who are engaged in the same way is a transformative experience that has changed the way we at the Marxist Education Project approach our project. And anyone can join anytime, just write to mar uh, info at marxedproject.org or uh, you'll see our stuff on, uh, we're all over the promotions on this. But I, Marcello, what a book. What a collection, and this book today, two essential books that have come out along with the last years of Karl Marx, another great book that we, we actually did about a 14-week course on. <laughs>